Welcome to African Roots, brought to you by DW. In this podcast series, we discover how individuals from across Africa shape the continent. I'm Leila Johnson Salami. And I'm Kai Nebe. This is African Roots. I'm Leila, and as always with Kai. Hey, Kai. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a pleasure, Leila. And uh, of course, on African Roots, we are always looking at interesting people. So I'm guessing you've got someone interesting today, right? Of course. I mean, do I ever, ever disappoint you? In fact... Yeah, fair enough. You, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, today I want to talk about a royal with a pretty long name. Like a royal royal? Like a royal person? Yeah, like a royal royal. Well, I mean, I want to <laughs> tell you <laughs> about a royal who took the fight to um, European power. But before okay. we get into that, Kai, um, how much do you know about Germany's colonial empire? I mean... I know you're from Namibia, which was one and in many ways still recovering, but fill me in a bit. Well, let's say, okay, you're right. Namibia was a former German colony. Then there was Tanzania. There was Togo. Um, mm-hmm. What? Missing one? Yeah, yeah. Um, there was also a part of Cameroon. So um, which, which royal are you talking about then today? Well, we're talking about a man named Rudolf Dwala Mangabel. Wow, that is a long name. <laughs> yep, I did say so. <laughs> um, Rudolf Duala Mangabel was born into a wealthy royal family um, back in 1873 in Duala, present-day Cameroon. So that's actually quite close to the seat of power then. So so was Bell a, a clan name or was it a royal name? What was it? Yeah, well, he was the grandson of a king, Ndumbe Lobe Bell, um, also named King Bell. Now, he had signed a so-called Treaty of Protection with the German Empire in 1884. And just for a bit of context here, Africa was in the process of being carved up um, by European powers at the Berlin Conference. Quite literally, European powers like France, Britain, Germany, Italy and Spain um, agreed to divide African territory among themselves um, so that they wouldn't come to blows. To put it lightly. Okay, so so you're basically saying that uh, Rudolf Tuala Mangabel grew up in a German colony. Yeah. He was also one of the first subjects to be educated in Germany. Um, he went to a school in Arlen in Baden-Württemberg before continuing with higher education at Bonn's university, um, where he graduated, by the way, with an equivalent of a law degree. Wow. There are, however, no official records of his time in Bonn. Okay, but why would Duala Mangabel actually study in Germany? Oh, well, Kai, you know, it's kind of hard to say um, with certainty, but Germany's colonial plan was a little fuzzy in the early days. Um, I think there were many that wanted to see Germany supplanted to other areas of the world, which meant that some of the local elites like Rudolf needed to be educated in the European school of thought, right? So after his studies, um, Rudolf then returned to Cameroon, and this was mainly to help his father, King Bell, govern the Douala Kingdom before succeeding him then in 1908. Okay, so was Rudolf Douala Mangabel treated differently then? Mm, At home, yes, he was. See, Rudolf had studied law in Germany and already worked for the German colonial administration, if you see where I'm going with this. Okay, so yeah, I'm I'm guessing then he was... In in Cameroon, at least, he was seen as part of the colonial administration or the machinery of the colony, I guess. That's it. That's it. So some even regarded the Bell clan as collaborators with the German colonial administration. And um, Rudolf, because of his education, was pretty much seen as like an intermediary, right? Both by the Germans and also the locals of Douala. But As German colonial ambitions grew and they started taking liberties with the own rules and agreements that they had set up, um, Rudolf was suddenly in quite a difficult position. What do you mean? Because it sounds like he was sort of at the center point of that then. Well, this is where it gets pretty interesting, because in 1910, Germany wanted to forcibly relocate the Douala people from their homes to build a European-only settlement in Cameroon. 
And at that time, the Germans wanted to keep the local people away from Plateau Joss, which is currently Bonanjo. And not to sidetrack too much, but just an interesting fact here. Um, you know, Nigeria borders Cameroon, Nigeria being where I'm from. And in Nigeria, um, we have a state that is called Plateau and the capital of Plateau is Joss, which is quite interesting. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, not to get confused, though. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> Um, anyway, so um, yeah, so they wanted to keep them away, um, also from the Douala administrative district, um, and this is actually crazy. But because they accused them of spreading malaria, what you you can't be serious. Yeah, <laughs> um, you heard right. <laughs> they literally accused them of spreading malaria. Okay, so what did uh, Rudolf Douala Mangabel do about it if he was actually in quite a cozy relationship with the Germans then? Well, this was a bit too much for Rudolf. I mean, as one can imagine. I mean, your people are being accused of spreading malaria. Um, so he resigned from his role in um, the colonial administration and he took up the fight against the expropriation by the German colonists who were clearly violating the 1884 Germano Dualo Treaty. But Kai, what distinguishes Rudolf Duala Mangabel from many other colonial or sorry, anti-colonial fighters is that he tried to use German laws to stop German encroachment. Um, and I think that's pretty interesting. Duala Mangabel's action was a fair fight which took place at the right moment. That is to say, Duala Manga was the leader of his people, the Bells of Duala. He had to rise at that moment because in the 1910s, the German authorities had established an iniquitous project which broke the treaty signed by his parents. That's Cameroonian historian Sylvie Law Andela. Um, of course, the legal fight didn't last and Rudolf Douala Mangabel shifted his fight to the Cameroonian hinterland um, where he called for a rebellion. Valère Epé, a traditionalist and a close relation to the Bell royal family, um, explains it a little bit better here. Listen in. When they started to expropriate all the natives from Bonanjo, which I belong to, and even worse when they established two cities within the city, the white town and the black town, that is to say apartheid, everybody in Douala rose up as one. Okay, so how did the Germans react to this? Well, I mean, as you can imagine, Kai, the uprising un unsettled the German colonial administration. Um, Rudolf Duala Mangabel was targeted for stirring up a rebellion. Um, let's listen in, though, again to Sylvie Loandela. It was a colonial context. Mangabel was a colonized man rising up against the master. Had he been a leader or not, brought up in Germany, he was still a colonized man rising up against the master's authority. On top of that, when Duala Manga Bell started his fight, it was the time when Germany was up against the wall during the First World War. And, you know, I think she puts it pretty clearly. You know, this was a colonized man rising up against colonization, you know, um, and Duala Mangabel never really stopped trusting that the German system of laws could be used to bring the colonial abuses to book. That's quite crazy when you think about it, because, you know, you have a guy who was really brought up in a land where they believed in law and order. And, you know, Germany today is such a country where laws are govern everything. But I guess it must have been so hard for him to uh, watch the, the German colonial authorities have a certain set of rules in their own country and then just, I guess, disregard them as, as soon as it suited them. So what did he do? You, you know, I think you made a very interesting point there because um, that's, that's what I think is quite smart. The fact that he decided to use their own laws to counter them because what can you really say to that? And I think the effect that it has even beyond the influence that he could have had um, within the colonial administration, I think just getting his people, getting Cameroonians to see that we are being governed in a certain way that clearly they're not applying to themselves is, um, I think that's very powerful because I think it was sort of an awakening for many people. Um, but not to sidetrack too much, to answer your question, 
um, what he did was he tried his very best to align himself with like-minded German politicians and um, Cameroonians in the diaspora that could support his cause. I mean, if I was in his position, I would have stopped trusting the invaders a long time ago. Yep. That's a very good point. You know, I also thought about that too. But his great-granddaughter, Marilyn Duala Bell, provides some insight into his thinking. See, culturally, Rudolf was very European, and so was the royal family. To Marilyn and other Cameroonians, Rudolf Duala Manga Bell really stood for the concept of metissage, which implies mixed cultural identities, um, the reconciliation of one's own historical roots with external influences. And for Marilyn Duala Bell, this notion is still very important today. I have the feeling that he accepted his métissage. I think it is important for Cameroonians today not to confine themselves to some semblance of conservatism. With that attitude, we are heading for disaster. We cannot use our old way of thinking today. I believe he passed down to the family this notion of accept your metissage. And I would like the Cameroonians to read in Douala Manga's fight this acceptance of mixed cultural identities, this complementarity of strength. In the end, did his beliefs actually create some sort of peaceful German Cameroonian society? Well, I wish I had a better answer to that, but unfortunately not. Um, when it was clear that the German thirst for land took precedence over peace with the local people, Rudolf Duala Manga called up popular demonstrations and um, colonial troops arrested him on the 7th of August 1914 for treason against Imperial Germany. Okay, good. Just keep going. Just a day later, um, without a proper trial or any of the legal assistance afforded to citizens of Germany, um, King Rudolf Duala Mangabel was sentenced to death and hanged. His last words, whoa, by whoa, the wait, way, wait. in one day. Yeah. Did you? Did I hear that right? Yeah, you heard that. You heard that right. Literally a day later, um, and there was no proper trial here or anything. Um, you, you can just see the cruelty shining through in that. You know. And what I find interesting, Kai, um, very powerful last words that he had. His last words were, you are hanging innocent blood. The consequences will be much greater. Even if, you know, hypothetically, the German colonial project was to succeed, wouldn't they have kind of needed someone exactly like King Rudolf, who had sort of been raised in both cultures and understood both cultures? I mean, you and I would think so, right? You know, especially in today's world, um, you would see that as a benefit. Um, but I, I guess it's also kind of easy to say in hindsight. I mean, that's if you assume that the Germans had any intention of making a colony either fair or peaceful, um, which colonialism by its very definition just can't do anyway. Um, ironically, though, despite how European King Rudolf Duala Mangabel aspired to be, Today, Cameroonians remember him as a martyr and a hero who really stood up against colonial masters. Some historians even suggest that Rudolf Duala Mangabel's rebellion inspired the Cameroonian um, independence movement. It's almost like the Germans created a martyr out of somebody who actually almost wanted this colonial project to work when we look at it now. I mean, Duala Mangabel, I guess the way you are describing him seems to be a guy who, to, I wouldn't necessarily say agreed with the German colonial project, but he seemed to sort of have a far more optimistic way of how it could be. And um, it's it's interesting. You, it's it's really interesting because it leads nicely into the the person I'd like to introduce you to after the break, um, because we're going to meet a freedom fighter from another German colony in Namibia, um, who really just took up arms against the imperialists. But his tactics were slightly different. DW African Roots. Find new African Roots episodes on dw.com slash African Roots, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Leila. I'm Kai. <laughs> Kai. Oh, it's nice to meet you again. <laughs> <laughs> um, before the break, you were talking about a Namibian freedom fighter. So we are heading to where you are from. 
Yeah, we are going to Namibia, which is a country in Southwest Africa. It's one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world. It's wide open spaces. It's very dry and a lot of the country is really inhospitable. And uh, believe it or not, Leila, the only perennial rivers, which are to say rivers that flow all year round, they exist, but only on the country's borders. Within the country, there are no perennial rivers. (laughs) Oh, wow. So that's very dry then. And um, Namibia is also a relatively new country, no? Yeah, relatively. I mean, in 1990, Namibia gained independence from apartheid South Africa after an almost uh, three-decade-long independence struggle. And just for some background here, Germany lost World War I in 1918, and as a result of that, lost all of their overseas colonies. Basically, South Africa had administered Namibia since the 1990 Treaty of Versailles. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's a lot of history to take in in about 10 seconds. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But but that's all just basically to get to the starting point of our man uh, Hendrik Witboy. And that's the guy I'd like to introduce you to. And who was Hendrik Witboy? Yeah, good question, Leila. See, most Namibians, myself included, would have first come into contact with Hendrik Witboy because his face is on Namibian banknotes. Uh, his full name, Captain Hendrik Udboy, was a feared guerrilla warrior um, whose Nama tribe, Nama group, um, fought against Germany's colonial forces. Uh, the notes are a re- daily reminder, perhaps, um, of, of Hendrik Witboy, uh, whose local name was Tanseb Gaib Gabemab, or the snake in the grass because of his guerrilla tactics. And uh, I just love this uh, description of a, of a young Nama woman, Mavulin Natasha Gregression, who remembers what it was like growing up in a Nama community where they ha- talked about Vidbo in sort of daily life. The most Nama speaking people, I don't know about today's generation, but our elders refer to the money as Nansep. My grandmother, when I was young, and she would send me like to go pick up her money for her, like at a friend's place or wherever that she loaned money. She'd always tell me, "Come, I say, is it And that loosely translates to "Go and get the ngansi for me." And I'm like, "Grandma, what?" <laughs> and of course, they're the proper pronunciations of his. Um, local name Nanseb. Yeah, being I'm not going to even there. attempt. <laughs> a very difficult one to pronounce. But basically, for for many uh, Nama people, Hendrik Vitbo is a hero. He was born around uh, 1830, uh, actually in present day South Africa, um, and he was born into quite an important Nama family. And uh, the Nama in Namibia were once a nomadic uh, tribe of pastoralists living in southwestern Africa. They moved a kind of across South Africa to Namibia and back. Interesting. Um, I, I mean, I'm quite interested in knowing, though, how, how did he become a Namibian fighter? Well, because, yeah, the fact that he was born in South Africa does raise questions. You see, um, one has to see Southern Africa at that time in the 1830s, 1840s, very much in a state of flux. Shaka Zulu's expansion wars had shaken up East and South Africa in the Cape, which is the bottom of Africa. Dutch uh, fur trekkers and colonists carrying guns were gobbling up land and persecuting any group that stood in their way. And that is why the Nama people found themselves sort of pushed north into southern Namibia, which is where they eventually settled. So would, um, would southern Namibia at that time have been more peaceful than being within South Africa as we know it today? Mm, Not for long. You see, Namibia is a big country, but most of the land is very dry, which means pastoralists um, have to roam very far to graze their herds. And Nama clans regularly came into um, skirmishes with Herero pastoralists from the north of the country. And this is actually where Hendrik uh, Witboy gained a reputation as a warrior. So here we have someone who grew up in South Africa or was born in South Africa and um, is pretty much forced to flee from where he is, um, heads then to southern Namibia and today is a national hero. I am very interested in knowing um, 
more about what led Vitboy to being regarded as a national hero today? Well, that has a lot to do with colonialism. Um, basically, um, the common enemy arrived in the form of German uh, colonialists. In 1884, as you actually mentioned in the story with Duala Mangabel, Germany had declared Namibia a protectorate and then later a colony. Uh, German uh, settlers streamed into Nama territory in the 1890s and competition for land and exploded into war. And at this point, uh, Hendrik Witboy called on his former nemesis, the Herero people, to unite against the Germans. Hendrik Witboy was always trying to, as I said, unify, get people together to fight against common enemies. And I must say that I would also see a common enemy in the ways of tribalism or ethnicism which can destroy, which will divide even words that he used, maybe in a different way, but divide and rule. He saw that as the German colonialists' strategy, you know, to divide the tribes and then rule over them. And this is what ethnicity does without having a physical enemy. That's Anton van Wietersheim, a retired Namibian politician and farmer. Now, at this point, I should say, Hendrik Witboy's nickname, Snake in the Grass, was not always meant positively. Yeah, I did pick up on that at the beginning when you said that one of his names um, was Snake in the Grass. But tell me, what do you mean? Well... For example, um, after suffering a vicious German attack on his village in 1893, Hendrik Witboy signed a peace agreement with the Germans, even offering Nama warriors to fight against other tribes, um, which obviously was kind of seen as a move where he was shifting allegiances or getting out of tricky situations. But a decade later, after seeing the Germans' insatiable appetite for land and willingness to use force, the 74-year-old Hendrik Witboy actually led the Nama in open rebellion against the Germans. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it's a 74-year-old fighter here. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, he was killed in action. Um, and after the rebellion, um, the German colonial authorities went on to virtually exterminate the Nama and Herero people in what is now widely considered the first genocide of the 21st century. My goodness. I just need to take that in for a second because, wow. Um, so what did his death mean for Namibia's ethnic groups? Because I know you said that, um, uh, you know, Witboy had signed a peace agreement with the Germans and um, at sometimes he was even fighting against other tribes. So what did this now mean? So I think that there uh, previously there was always there were always skirmishes between um, Herero and Nama clans even before the Germans arrived. But in Germany they found a common enemy which was far more brutal than they'd ever experienced before. And while a uh, Herero Nama rebellion did in fact fail. The consequences for the Herrera and Nama under German rule were really terrible, like seriously terrible. Um, but I guess Witboy's reputation for resistance and actually defending his people cemented his place in Namibian consciousness. Um, here's Anton von Wietersheim again. I think if we think of his legacy, we should think of his vision of unifying people, of unifying different tribes to stand against any threat from outside. And tribalism and racism for us in Namibia is definitely a serious threat for our common future. I think he put it quite well there, you know. Um, but Kai, you're a Namibian of German extraction. I am curious, how were you taught about Vidboy in your community? Well, we we did hear about him, um, especially like in primary school and that. And in the German community, he was kind of spoken about in whispers and quite honestly, a fair amount of uh, saltiness. He was, this comes from the fact that he was a truly a thorn in the side of the German colonial forces, almost to the point where German generals actually had respect for Witboy's uh, ability to fight, despite being always severely outnumbered, always on the run and always outgunned. You must remember that in these days, uh, the guerrillas were fighting mostly on horseback. Um, they knew the land extremely well. They were far better at the Germans at, at real guerrilla warfare. And German settlers were really fearful of them. 
Mm. So they kept the German settlers on edge. Um, and is all that we know about Hendrik Witboy um, told through the eyes of Europeans? And see, this is actually quite interesting because no, um, this I think is what makes him unusual, quite a bit similar to Rudolf Duala Manga Bell in some ways. Um, Hendrik Witboy was raised in a prominent family and he was quite educated for his time and fluent in many languages, one of which was Cape Dutch. And he actually wrote letters and kept diaries. And the reason we know more about him than other freedom fighters in that of that era is that there was really a written record of him. That's interesting. Yeah, so his surviving uh, journals, which were written in Dutch, contain some very prophetic insights, actually, into the menace of colonialism and how it would leave a long shadow on Southern Africa. The journals, by the way, have even been included in UNESCO's uh, Memory of the World Register as a documentary uh, for world heritage. And that's actually very good to know, you know. Um, so in both Henrik Witboy and also Rudolf Duala Manga Bell, um, we, we see almost Europeanized Africans um, who in a way were more aware of the imperial culture and then taking the fights of the colonizers. Yeah, I guess Europeanized in inverted commas because they were certainly Africans and they were certainly proud of their of their land and their own heritage. But they did understand, I guess, a bit more of the European um culture than many others did at that time. And it is true that there are many detractors of both Hendrik Witboy and, uh, like you said, Duala Manga Bell, who said, well, at some level, they co- they collaborated with the German government. Yet today, both leaders are really celebrated for fighting uh, colonialism and really, I think, standing up for their own people. I mean, Hendrik Witboy is honored at Heroes Acre in Namibia's capital, Vintuk. Yeah, you know, it's a great legacy. And just to backtrack a bit, it's like um, what I mean, I think what I was trying to say is that they kind of like used um, that Europeanized side or the fact that they had that um, that separate, completely separate exposure um, to their advantage and um, to the advantage of their people. And it's quite a legacy to have. I, I get that much of um, Vipboy's legacy is in Namibia, but what I do also want to know, Kai, is because this is a this is a man who was born in South Africa. How do South Africans see him? Well, that is an interesting question. And the, the short answer is he's not so visible. But um, I actually have a cool guy that I'd like to introduce you to. It's, his name is uh, Himmel Biersum. Uh, he's a South African musician who raps in the Afrikaans language. It's a language descended from Dutch. And he actually wrote a song about Hendrik Witboy where he um, he really tries to firstly uh, bring attention to this character. And also, I guess in the song, he also tries to inspire pride for South Africans and their own ancestry. We don't have that icons that people say, ah, oh, Bartolomeos Dias or Che Guevara or Wang Fei Hung or whatever. And so it's so important for our people to have that. I think the beautiful way to put it is to say the rock from which we were cut, you know, to know this is who we are, who we can strive for. And, you know, I love that because, I mean, even with this podcast, even with African Roots, I think a huge part of it is um, showcasing the showcasing heroes that we have here on the continent that a lot of people just don't know about, you know, um, the information may be out there, but it's just not pushed as forward. The history isn't pushed as forward as much as the history of um, people from other regions. Um, but I'm, I'm interested because you said that he's a rapper and he wrote a song. Can we hear it? Yes, of course. So, Leila, the, the thing is that the song is in Afrikaans. Um, it's a language that is descended from Dutch, which a lot of people in South Africa and Namibia speak. Um, and it's also probably the language most similar to the Dutch that um, Hendrik Witboy wrote in his diaries. Let's go for it. I want to hear it. Viti altid wat de kan to nie. Ene fula nikas man na lied. Oses mozu kala lang kali. As ek anak zie my land te nie. Dis unbelievable kam was hi gekul down to die ben in nil. Die kan te rie is te laat us net ham de willi na ma people het gul. Skri wat boy, 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 wat boy. 
that's where we will have to leave things for today. African Roots is a cooperation between Deutsche Welle and the Gerda Henkel Foundation. Special thanks to our producers Thomas Schmidt, Philip Zantner and our voiceover artists. Contributions by Henry Fotso, Victoria Averil and Renata Rengura. I am Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson Salami. Join us again next time and bye for now. Bye. African Roots.